Hey everyone, good night and apologies for the delay in tonight's Taking Stock. It's my pleasure to be here with you. I'm Kalila Reynolds for another episode of Taking Stock Live. Woo! Coming up a high from last night at the new Masterclass Money Marketing. How many of you were there? Drop a hand in the comments. Let me know. <laughs> and let me know what it was like for you as well. So we have another great show coming up for you this evening. If you haven't joined Money Mission yet, just head on over to moneymission.mn.co and understand everything that I'm talking about. But tonight, it is about some developments in the tech world so here's a look at what's coming up in our show, followed by what's hot in business. Now, come on, let's get this money. Groundbreaking. Chat GPT creator OpenAI will now let you build special purpose AI apps using its technology. And they've also introduced an all new AI economic sector and more. We'll find out more about these latest developments from co-founder of Vojo Virtual Solutions, Kevin Brown. And the analysts weigh in on the latest market developments. First, Caribbean International Bank is rebranding to its Canadian parent company, CIBC. And U.S. REIT Realty Income six months performance is out. How did they perform? We'll discuss. But first, here's What's Hot, brought to you by JMMB Group, your best interest at heart. Trinidad-based distribution company A.S. Bryden & Sons is set to list on the main market of the Jamaica Stock Exchange later this week. The company, which was acquired by Sepred recently, has received approval to list its ordinary and preferred shares on the exchange by introduction. By listing its shares by introduction, A.S. Bryden will not be offering any new shares for sale to the public, but is publicly listing all existing shares and making them available for trading. A.S. Bryden will list on the JSC main market on November 10. NCB Financial Group shareholders last week approved the board's call for an additional public offer. The offer will see between 300 to 450 million new ordinary shares being issued in the coming months. NCB Chairman Michael Lee Chen said previously that the company is heading towards the resumption of regular dividend payments. NCB has not paid a dividend since May 2021. If the APO is fully subscribed, NCB will raise some $20 billion. Over 1 million files of personal information from the telecommunications services of Trinidad and Tobago's database have been leaked on the dark web. International hacking group RansomX last week announced that they infected TSTT's system with ransomware and stole up to 6 gigabytes of data. The stolen data reportedly includes names, email addresses, national ID numbers, phone numbers and other sensitive data. The hack reportedly affects some 800,000 Trinidad and Tobago residents. The country's Minister of Public Utilities, Marvin Gonzalez, has ordered an independent investigation into the hack. Online fashion retailer Shein just announced that it is acquiring British fast fashion brand Misguided. Misguided is a major player in the British fast fashion industry. The deal will see Shein manufacturing Misguided's products and selling them on both companies' websites as an independent brand. This is the second major deal for Shein this year. The company also recently announced that it plans to launch a co-branded clothing line with Forever 21. Shein started selling its clothes in Forever 21 stores early this year after it took a stake in Forever 21's parent company. Former FTX CEO Sam Bankman-Fried is facing up to 110 years in prison after he was found guilty on several fraud charges. The charges were wire fraud, conspiracy to commit wire fraud, and conspiracy to commit money laundering. A New York jury found that Bankman-Fried intentionally misused his customers' funds and lied about it. Before filing for bankruptcy, FTX was the world's second largest cryptocurrency exchange. The former CEO was accused of falsifying FTX's numbers and using customer funds to bankroll his other businesses. Bankman Freed is scheduled to be back in court in March for sentencing. What's Hot was brought to you by JMMB Group, your best interest at heart. This segment of Taking Stock is brought to you by Bulwark Insurance Agency, insurance made easy. Welcome back. Welcome back. Let me see who we have in the house. I know you guys are tuning in from all over the world. Big up to Kish, checking in from London, as usual. Always one of the early people. Michael in Portmore. We got Moses in Trinidad. 
20 shots in the house. Let's get this money. Antoinette's in Arizona. Ingrid's in Bull Bay. Sean is ready and waiting. Jermaine is in China, all the way in China. Anthony is in Portmore. Dwight is in the house. <laughs> Raquel is ready as usual. And we have, she says, like and come on, money makers. Who else we have here? Portmore in the building. Negril, the United States of Portmore. <laughs> all right. It's great to see everybody joining us this evening for another episode of Taking Stock. And there's some exciting news on the tech front. So chat GPT, the developers of ChatGPT, OpenAI, are introducing new technology that will allow you to essentially build your own version of ChatGPT using their technology and using plain language. This is a huge development for tech, for business, for many, many industries. So joining me now is Kevon Brown. He's co-founder of Vota Virtual Solutions here in Kingston, Jamaica. He's very excited about it. So, uh, Kevon, hi, good evening. Good evening, Kalila. How, what's up? I am good, but I don't think I'm as good as you because you're beaming right now. <laughs> you, yeah. Uh, this news broke. You were like, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, to, to give you some context, the first time the iPhone was unveiled, I was, I think, in my second year at university and uh, i wouldn't have known then but that was like one of the the the, the pinnacle of or, or the change in how we interact with mobile devices and that has revolutionized the way we do it today up to today you know if you don't have an iphone you don't have an android phone technically you don't have a phone because those are the only two major operating systems that you can get on and I consider this kind of announcement to be on par leading up to the next set of or the next revolution in the, the, the tech space. Wow, that big, that major. So explain what exactly is happening. All right. So so the creators of Open, sorry, the creators of ChatGPT, um, OpenAI, they had their first ever developer conference. They call it Dev Day. It happened yesterday and they made quite a few announcements and uh, you know it's not it's the first time they would have come to the public with anything so nobody really you know thought what they would come with more than just oh a new version of gpt but the first thing they announced was that chat gpt had a weekly um, user base of over 100 million people and wow. that is ridiculous that is one of the fastest growing consumer products, digital products, you know, in the world. So when they started to roll out, you know, the different announcements, one was the price decrease for the new um, language model, which is called GPT-4 Turbo. So we have the latest one, which is GPT-4, or at least the outgoing one. And now we have the latest, newest and greatest GPT-4 Turbo. So what that does, Essentially, it improves upon what was there before, but it now comes in at a lower cost to run for developers. So it can generate up to um, 96 million words in between what you give it and what it outputs in one single go. So that's a limit. That is How, how long does it take to do that? Well, I, I'm not sure anyone is actually giving it that many um input tokens to do that but i would figure it would it would take a while if it's gonna do a lot of that but if you're doing simple you know your everyday chat gpt typing what is this how do i do that and the rate at which it responds within seconds you know microseconds i'm quite sure if you max it out it would actually maybe buckle a little bit but it will um actually generate it in the same almost real time because they're actually operating on azure which is Microsoft's data center and their entire hosting platform. So think of Amazon that runs a web and they have all these servers all over the place, all over the world. And Microsoft is one of those competitors where they have servers. So OpenAI actually uses Azure, Microsoft Azure, and 
the speed at which it will compute all of the input that it gives, that it, it, it takes in and it gives out is going to be ridiculous because Microsoft owns about 49% of that company. So they're going to ensure that the user experience is top notch. So the new chat GPT for Turbo is more for developers, you said. It's not really geared towards the regular public who uses it, the 100 million users. Well, it is geared towards both. The, the, the developers have it for their own custom applications, but you can get it in, it's going to be a default model for chat GPT um, plus subscribers specifically. So if you're not a plus subscriber, you will have only up to 3.5 turbo, I believe. But if you're a plus subscriber, you will have access to GPT-4 turbo. And GPT-4 turbo comes with some added benefits. Um, it has, well, let me just get to the ones that would be more interesting for persons would be, it, it can actually serve the web. It has more updated information up to April of this year. And you can actually upload files it can, you know, see, it can describe whatever it is that you give to it. Um, and it is much faster than before. It knows a lot more. It can actually make actions as well and connect to other applications. So for developers to use it, they can actually connect it to something else. So for example, Zapier and um, Canva, you can make a prompt and it will say you're using with Canva, you make a prompt in ChatGPT, create me this thing at this size, and it will say, okay, this is what you want. Connect your Canva account and boom, just like that. Really? So that's what the ChatGPT4 Turbo is? Or that's the, the new thing that they announced? That's some of its capabilities. Yes, so, so that is one of the things that they announced. They announced quite a few other things. Um, the two other things that I think are major um game changers that would be in light to the whole iphone revolution that i mentioned before is that they are now allowing users to tap into their gpt technology to create essentially mini chat gpts so let's think about it when the iphone was created it was a revolutionary product it had music it would make phone calls and it can connect it to the internet then you had the app store which set off a chain of re chain reaction where the slogan there's an app for that i don't know if you remember that slogan. i remember when this. that, that slogan that. came out yeah right and you had a lot of it, it it opened the floodgates for small developers to now create applications for the apple ecosystem upload it to the app store and you know it sends out to millions of people so the model is the same no g Sorry, OpenAI is now giving regular users, well, specifically the plus subscribers, the ability to now create their own chat GPT with this, the parameters that, you know, whatever they want. So if you want to create a GPT that is a travel agent and or you want to create a GPT that is education focused, maybe teaching someone how to read or to spell or whatever it may be, you can just created in no, no code needed, no coding abilities, no coding skills necessary. It's simple, drag and drop, click, and you go. And then they have the GPT store where all those GPTs will be hosted. And regular users can now go and either purchase them or they can download them for free, depending on whatever the creator wants. Um, in addition to that, OpenAI said that they would have a revenue sharing model. So where the best or most popular, popularly used GBTs would get a financial incentive from the company. So it, 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 it has totally replicated the App Store model. So I heard this news yesterday. I heard it through you because you posted it in our group chat. And I was like, but what's the GPT? I understand what chat GPT is, right. but they're saying that, okay, you get the ability to make your own GPT. And I was a little bit confused as to what that actually was. What does GPT even stand for? All right. So it stands for generative pre-trained transformer. So oh. simply put, it is a language learning model and I'm stripping it down very plainly where you train this um you train this piece of software on a wide variety of data sets 
that you want it to you know respond on and you what 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 you use with it or what you do with it it will determine the medium so gpt is just the engine while chat gpt is just the frame of the vehicle if you understand what i'm saying so chat gpt is just the chatbot form of gpt but technically gpt can be used in a lot of other mediums but the most popular one now is through a chatbot so with this um feature what they're going to be doing is allowing persons to basically rip off chat gpt legally and let it do whatever it is that you want it to do and it's in the same form that everybody knows a chatbot so you can create your own chatbot you can create a kalila chatbot and you can train your kalila chatbot on everything financial everything about kalila everything about taking stock everything about what what we what we do and when someone comes and asks the kalila bot for you know what's the best stock out there right now and the kalila bot will respond based on what it is that you trained it on so you would have to upload the information feed it the information that you want to feed it it doesn't sound that different from bots that already exist because you can train bots right now to respond to dms for example automatic emails based on what somebody told them and what you tell it to do right and that is where i think the i wouldn't say genius but that is where the the the, the comparison with apple comes in the iPhone, original iPhone, was not the first smartphone. It was definitely by, by not a long mile. But it was the only one that really encapsulated what the future would look like. It is a similar thing. Um, ChatGPT is not the only chatbot that you can do and create that with. But with ChatGPT, you're leveraging an already established data set that is exceedingly large. You don't have to do anything. You just drag and drop. Most chatbots, you will have to get like a developer to create it, or it will be using maybe another piece of data set that you will have to fine tune. And all of that requires some technical knowledge. Now, what OpenAI has done is that they created that entire infrastructure for you. And all you need to do is click two buttons and allow persons to type what they want. And you can upload your files you can do all that you want so the difference is really the vision going forward and what they have created through it more so than the actual thing itself it's it's about what it represents going into the future and less about what it is really now because it's not yeah. that much different from what's out there but it it where we see it going into the future it is opening a considerable amount of doors all right, so I know you geek out over this type of stuff. Have you <laughs> tried it already? Like, is it available to try already? All right, so it is, I'm not sure if it's available for plus subscribers, but developers can actually use some of the APIs currently. Um, their version of the GPTs that I just described is actually called Assistant for Developers. So it's a simple tool that you can use in the playground. I actually started playing around with it and uh, it has a similar interface to what you would use your own or how you would create your own GPT. So it's, you give, the, you give the, the assistant a name, you tell it the instructions that you want and then you select the model that you wanted to use. In this case, it would be GPT-4 Turbo and now you have other options that you didn't have before, like running functions, meaning you can tell it to execute something, whether it to be a send an email or um, like a post on Facebook or something like that. And you can actually upload your own data, which you couldn't do before with any of the chat GPT mm. versions before. So if you have, for example, uh, let me give my example that I did. I created a chatbot, a financial um, chatbot, or financial journalist chatbot, and I nicknamed it Kalila. And I uploaded the one- Wait, you actually email. did this? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I did this. And okay. I, 
I uploaded the 1GS prospectus to the platform. And then I simply asked it, hey, can you tell me about the 1GS IPO? How has the company performed? And it gave me exactly what was in the document. It read the document and gave me what I wanted. And it also added a little snippet at the end, not necessarily to tell me whether I should invest, but it told me, you know, based on this, the overall performance of the company is X, Y, and Z, and you should probably look at it. So it this was not um, available before. And because of how it has been released, meaning it's now given to the everyday man, so to speak, or at least those who can sub, um, you know, subscribe to ChatGPT+, Plus, you can create this yourself. And then you can submit it to OpenAI. You can add a price tag to it. And if somebody finds enough value in it, then they will pay for it. And wow. that's how you just make passive income just like that. And wow. then on top of that, if your app does well, OpenAI will pay you on top of that because it does well. Wow. No, I love this idea. So I like that you said you can upload information. So you train it with your own stuff. So I right. could upload all the previous episodes of Taking Stock, which we're at almost 200 now. All right. the previous episodes of Money Monday, or at least the transcripts. Um, all the previous bottom line videos, all those prospectus reviews, IPO reviews that we've done. And somebody could ask Kalila GPT about right. a particular question about, you know, something related to something that we did a while ago. And it would respond like me yes. using and you can train it to use my voice, right? not my audio voice, but, you know, to write like how I would sound, like how I would speak. Right. Correct. I'm That's starting exactly to get it, it now. Work. That's very, very interesting. Hmm. I might and need to, to give it this assignment, Kevin, <laughs> to build out Kalila GPT. Sure, already uh, in the works. Um, well, to top it off, just to, just to add to it, one of the, the, the most um, important aspects of it, and it's been a very controversial topic since AI started to come up, is who owns the rights to all of these things? When mm. the chatbot gives you what it gives you, who owns this? Now, OpenAI has something called the Copyright Shield, which is essentially they have protected you against any form of litigation once you're using their product to generate anything. Everything that ChatGPT um, gives to you is owned by you. And if someone comes to you and say, hey, I don't know, I'm going to sue you for this, OpenAI is saying that they will step in and pay those bills for you. That's how confident they are in this platform. Very, very interesting. So we have a few questions for you, Kevon, and some comments as well. Christopher says that it sounds like I'm planning my vacation. <laughs> just, in a couple of years, maybe less, I can just have ChatGPT host the show for me or some type of AI. Uh, Sean wants to know, how do you get access to it, though? I think you said it. You, you, ha you use the developer version, right? Right. So there are two ways to access it. And, you know, it, it's for different people. You have developers and then you have the regular layman user. In order to access the newest versions of GPT or GPT-4 Turbo as a regular user, not a developer, you have to subscribe to J Chat GPT Plus. I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm not I'm recalling how much it is per month now, but you can use it and you have access to all of the, the models. Yeah, well, they're only going to give you GPT-4 Turbo which is the latest and greatest, and you will have access to all the features that they would have talked about. You won't even know. You'll just start using it and it will just do the things for you. Um, the, the feature to create your own GPT has not yet been released. As far as I know, it has been announced, but it has not been released. I'm not sure. I haven't seen any timeline as to when it will happen, nor the app store, but for developers, you know, now actual developers who create their custom apps, they have access to a version of that called assistance. So where it has the same setup, but you actually need to know how to code to deploy it in some sort of application, but you can actually test it. Um, if, if you don't want to necessarily code, you can actually create an account on openai.com and you can stand up as a developer. I mean, they're not going to drill you and ask you questions that you don't know. You just need to attach a credit card and you will have access to it. So how it works is that 
it will bill you based on what you use. So it's not a subscription model where you pay monthly, you pay per what you use. So if you want to play around with it, you can do so by going there, um, attaching your credit card, and then you can go into the playground and you can go through some of the new features that are there. Um, just a little caveat for the, the, the regular person who want to go, some of, a lot of it is developer focused. So you may not understand some things, but for the assistance, it's pretty basic. It's very similar to what they demoed, what the GP, the, the creating your own GPT would look like. So it's a little bit more visually based. So you can actually click and know what to do. But if you're going to run it now in some sort of, you know, let other people use it, then that's where the coding knowledge will come in. So a question coming from Malcolm who wants to know what are the risks what are the risks? A little broad, but based on copyright shield, there are no risks for copyright. Um, the overall risk, I would say, for using this, for using OpenAI's platform is uh, what you call a vendor lock-in. So a vendor lock-in is simply when you use the producer of a product, if you use their product and only their product, when something changes, the whole thing shuts down. If you build your entire business on it, and then for some reason, open air goes under, your entire business model goes with it. And that is something that is, you know, within the dev developer community, it's, uh, it's a, pretty, a pretty big thing to look at. So not a lot of developers will take on new things when they see it because the, the risk of losing things are high. But when, you're, when you are using tools from companies that are super established like Google, Apple, um, Samsung, whatever, OpenAI, who is now backed by Microsoft, the chances of them are failing pretty low, especially considering that AI is on the rise um, popularity-wise and there's a ton of investments going into to, to open AI. So the risk of open AI shutting down is not really something that, you know, it's not something that probably happen anytime soon, if at all. So yeah, I hope that answered that question. Marty says, I'd rather they make it open source. Would that solve that problem? Yes, in a way it would actually. Open source is what a lot of developers like. Um, but open source also means the, the, what you call it, you know, the learning curve is very steep. So if it was open source, a lot of what they have now created, people wouldn't have access to it. So if you're going to know, have an open source platform where somebody can build their own GPT, then the layman couldn't use it because you definitely need COVID knowledge to, to use it. Open source simply means I have an engine and the engine is perfectly good. It can go, it can, can build anything on top of it. But if you don't know how to build an actual frame for the car, then it doesn't mean anything to you. That's what open source really is. Mm, understood. Craig wanted to know if you can do a live test or at the very least show us what you did. Sure. Um, let me see. How do I share? I want to see what it looks like. So okay. hit the present button. Okay. Can you see? Yeah. All right, so have this to zoom in though. All right, let's see. Is this a little better? Okay, put them back on. We need a different format, Kristen. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, so to the left here, this is what the, let me zoom out quickly, to show you what the user interface for assistance would look like. So when you're in the developer backend, you have your bar to the left. And then you have playground. Assistance is what is the feature that we're going to be using. But assistance only work inside the playground. So now we're in the playground. And here you create your, your bot. Um, I've already went through and, and called it Kalila. And in the instructions, just like how you prompt a chat GPT chat bot, you, these are the instructions that you will give it as well. So you're telling the chatbot what it is you want it to do. So one of the most popular way is to give it a persona. And that persona now will replicate who 
the person is. So a little backdrop on who you are and what you do. And then we go down to, cheat, to choose the model. So this is what it would look like. So GPT-41106 preview, this is the latest one, which is GPT-4 Turbo. Now, these are the things I was talking about, the extra tools. And this is where it starts to get a little developer-y. You have code interpreter and you have retrieval. Retrieval simply means your chat GPT will be able to search the internet. So if you create, if somebody asks it a question that requires it to surf the web, then you can enable it and it will do so and give back the information. So now we have files where I uploaded documents. So I uploaded two documents, best credit cards and um, one GS IPO prospectus. So now, armed with that piece of information, I already asked it about the one GS IPO, and this is how it responded. So I'm going to ask it something about credit cards. So let's see, what is the best credit card? use in Jamaica. It may take a little while when you click add and run. So what it's doing now is running that function in the back end, making the queries, reading the documents, and then now, boop, it pops up. So what so did it, it say? I can't read it. It's too small. Oh. As an AI, I don't have real-time access right. to current market rates offers. Right. So so I can't provide contemporary recommendations. <laughs> that right, so, does sound like something I would say. <laughs> in, right. In so I, right. So all we'd have to do is to train it to say, all right, instead of saying I am an AI, you know, I am Kalila, or you know, to speak more in the first person, then it starts to give you a lot of the information that was requested. The best credit card for you will depend on a variety of factors, including your individual financial institutions, spending habits, etc. So it actually read the document and then it gave this, this information based on what is in the document. So if we ask it, what are the rates for, let's say, What's, what's a better question to ask? Something more about what are the fees for these cards, maybe? It could be like which bank has the lowest credit card fees? All right. Which credit card in Jamaica has the lowest fees? I think that should be in that document. And then we add and run. Ah, there we go. So determining which bank in Jamaica has the lowest credit card fees would require up-to-date data, etc. I think these are some of the things that it are some of the ways in which it responds are based on um, autocorrection that is already built in. So it tries to be safe, but it does actually read the the document. I tested this out earlier, but you know this is a beta software. And beta just simply means that it's still being tested and it may give results that are not so incomplete, so, so complete, and it may have a little bit of bugs, but yeah, overall it works. Very nice. Very nice. So a lot of people are asking about you now, Kevon. Somebody said, Sean, Sean said, oh, he's smart, smart. <laughs> and then I had people asking like, how can they get in contact with you if you're on LinkedIn and so on? Yes, I am on LinkedIn. You can just search for Kevin Brown on LinkedIn. Okay. Voto Studios, V-O-T-O. Voto Virtual Solutions. Um, we actually created a, a, an, 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 an app or a web application called Storybook AI. Um, it was featured on Smash Jamaica earlier this year. Maybe I think it was in March. And it, was, it is built off of OpenAI's platform. And what it is, is essentially a web application that creates storybooks for children, at least that's what it started off as. And we know up to over 2,000 users worldwide, and a lot of them are actually generating stories for adults, um, which I found to be very interesting. Um, so 
even with with these 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 what you call it now with these announcements from open air there's so much that we can do with that platform to 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 make it even better so for example gpt4 turbo being more smart and being able to generate more words and one of the requested things on storybook ai for for persons that have been using it is to be able to write an entire novel using the platform and now wow. with this extension we can actually do that so that is something we we're actually working on so if you want to check it out you can go to storybookai.app awesome stuff thank you so much kevin this is thank very you. very interesting and you guys can find him on linkedin if you're interested in utilizing his services <laughs> kevin one of the bright sparks of jamaica at the forefront of technology we are going to take a break not really a break what's it now i think it's our i think it's our poll question now and the poll question, notice when we came up with this poll question last week, it was so current. Today it kind of feels stale, but I still want to know the answer. Because last week, the whole week was all about the earthquake, right? Earthquake was Monday, and we were in our feelings about it all week, still talking about how we felt. But I want to know, what did you do when the earthquake struck? A, I freeze, I froze, and I didn't know what to do. B, I followed my emergency plan. C, I ran outside. D, a duck like Cliff Hughes <laughs> went under the table. E, other, leave a comment. You can take that poll on the community tab of our YouTube channel or on X, the app formerly known as Twitter. Now, last night was the money marketing webinar, part one of my money marketing masterclass. It was called Create. So we're doing this in four parts, create, grow, money, and business. So part one was all about content creation strategies, and it was so good. It really was, if I may say so myself, because you know, you know, but here's a little clip of what happened last night. Oh, they said I don't have the clip. Okay, no problem. Let's move right on to market recap then. Up next is a market recap, and we've got the analyst standing by. This segment of Taking Stock was brought to you by Bulwark Insurance Agency, insurance made easy. Hey, moneymakers, join the KRM fam with our official merch. Get it now at KhalilaReynolds.com. Let's get this money. The JC Combine Index lost over 8,000 points in October, or 2.5%. 126 stocks traded across the main and junior markets for the month. 45 made gains, 71 lost value, and 10 stayed the same. 569 million shares changed hands on the Jamaican dollar market, valued at $2.2 billion. Now here's a look at some of the highlights for October. The main index lost 2.5%, while the junior market was down 2%. The financial index lost 4%, and the manufacturing and distribution index was mostly flat. JMMB 7.25% VRJMDCR preference shares was October's most traded stock. It took up 12% of market volume with 70 million shares changing hands. The stock opened in November at $2. Fesco was the month's second most traded stock. The stock lost $0.63 cents to open the new month at $3.35. And JFP rounded out October's most traded. The stock's price remained unchanged, opening November at $1.56. Now let's see who are the biggest gains for the month. Edufo closed October's biggest gainer. The stock soared 57% to start the new month at $2.19. Wisinko had the second biggest jump of the month, closing at $21.81. And the Trans Jamaican Highway 8% was October's third biggest gainer. The stock was up almost 22% to start November at $2. On the losing side now, iCrate was last month's biggest loser. It lost 33% to open the new month at $0.69. Cents. Paramount Trading fell nearly 31% to open November at $1.38. And First Rock Real Estate Investments rounded out the month's biggest losers. The stock fell almost 23%, closing the month at $6.69. Over on the Trinidad and Tobago Stock Exchange, the Composite Index lost 1% last month. Massey was the most traded stock of the month. 
it lost 21 cents to open November at $4.61 TT. Prestige Holdings was the biggest gain up almost 44%. It opened the new month at $11.50 CT. And on the losing side, Trinidad and Tobago, NGL, fell 14% to open November at $11.04 TT. Over in the U.S., the Dow Jones was up 2% in October, while the S&P 500 gained 1%, and the Nasdaq was mostly stable. At the pumps, gas prices lost $4.50 in October, while regular diesel prices dipped $0.90 cents for the month, and low sulfur diesel lost $1.67. In foreign exchange, overall, the Jamaican dollar weakened in October, losing $0.65 cents against the U.S. dollar to close the month at an average $156.08 to 1 U.S. On the other hand, the JMD strengthened against the Canadian dollar, but weakened against the pound and euro. Finally, on the crypto markets, Bitcoin prices rose nearly 24% for the month, trading at $34,656 US on October 31. And Ethereum was up almost 5%, trading at $1,815 on October 31. This segment of Taking Stock, the Analysts, is brought to you by Profit Jump Starter. Disclaimer. This is not intended as financial advice. Please consult a licensed financial advisor before making investment decisions. Welcome back. Welcome back. Before I introduce our panel, let's take some of your comments. So Shelly is impacted by daylight savings times. Like I knew it was time for taking stock live. I hate time zone change. It just messes you up, right? Christopher. <laughs> Want to know if David Smith is released from prison? I have no idea. I've not been following that case at all. And different Christopher said, I use ChatGPT to generate and respond to email. However, I often wonder about how the data I input is stored and secured. Hmm. Sean says, I've learned more using ChatGPT than I did when I was in school. It's crazy good and so simple to use, but he too has a concern about security. Roswell says, one-on-one -on -one and iCreate can utilize this technology to leverage their online space and learning. It would do a faster and effective work than actual humans who are affected by bias and emotions, etc. I could absolutely use it because people DM me all the time. People DM me to ask me foolishness. So <laughs> not necessarily foolishness, but things that you can easily Google. I got a DM recently, like last night, somebody asked me, which credit union in Montego Bay they can open an account at. I'm like, I don't know. I don't live in Mo Bay. I don't know which credit union is there, but I could easily find out by Google and so could you. So I think a Kalila GPT is a pretty good idea. Who knows? We might indeed make it work. But let's introduce our analyst panel for this evening. Today we have Julian Morrison, who's the founder of Wealth Watch JA and business writer at the Jamaica Observer newspaper, David Rose. Welcome back, guys. Hey, Kalila. Is David there? Evening, Kalila. There he is. All right, good. So, David, let's start with you. So, we have some news in the banking sector. First Caribbean International Bank is no longer being going to be known as First Caribbean International Bank. They're rebranding to their parent company, CIBC, Tell me, why was that decision made? Well, it's more likely to, you know, just strengthen and align the branding of the bank. Because in context, when you think about it, we have two major Canadian banks, you know, in the region, dominantly being Scotia Bank and First Caribbean. However, whereas Scotia Bank, you know, retains that brand identity and image along with the trade name down in the rest of the region, CIBC took a little bit of a different step, whereas, you know, they actually just, you know, had a different established identity down here. So while you might see CIBC first Caribbean on the imaging and branding, you would still see first Caribbean as the legal name. <clears throat> so, you know, when you hear Scotiabank, you hear, you hear Scotiabank Jamaica, Scotiabank Trinidad and so forth. So just align that image, you know, kind of makes it a little bit easier to further build out a presence in the region while leveraging the identity that exists already in Canada. And it kind of makes sense when you think about the fact that they have established this identity here in the region, try to expect a sale 
of, well, CIBC that tried to execute a sale, the majority ownership a couple of years ago. And, you know, regulators rejected that. And, you know, they tried to sell through to their four territories. Then you get through Dominica. And I'm trying to remember if they got through St. Kitts, but, you know, they closed Dominica and they're just continuing forward. I believe they got the St. Vincent and Aruba sales through. And now they're actually planning to fully exit Dutch Caribbean. So they're planning to sell their Bonaire and Curacao operations to Orsha Bank. I don't know how to pronounce that C. I, have not, I don't know Dutch. So these are some of the moves and developments that have happened with First Caribbean. And well, it's just CIBC, you know, in the Caribbean. And the results always come out by, you know, early December. And they're planning to further build their presence out in Jamaica, which is, you know, that economic uh, uh, ATM for the Caribbean, in a sense. Because I'm pretty sure you've been following the developments on Twitter regarding Trinidad Kalila. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In terms the of the DOJ. Data, and, the data breach at TSTT? No, not that one, Kalila. Not that one. I'm talking about the BOJ and the bank, Central Bank of Trinidad and Tobago no longer allowing that exchange you know oh yes i did see that i saw that press release yeah so you can't send back your tt dollars through boj basically and then the boj came out with an update yesterday where they said it wasn't something that they initiated on their side you know the central bank of china and tobago was you know the other party that started this temporary halt of you know moving tt back from jamaica to trinidad because what I was supposed to realize is that while persons love to say, hey, Trinidad dollar, you know, it's stronger relative to the United States dollar in Trinidad to get USD is kind of like trying to get water in a desert. It is that difficult. So what do I mean by that? If you are based in Trinidad, it's up to the central bank to decide, you know, if they are going to let you get the amount of effects that you want and then the quantities that you actually do want. So some persons, well, before this year, could take as much as six months just to get USD through your regular bank or even through, you know, the central bank. Whereas here in Jamaica, we can literally take up our card and just uh, spend on Amazon, spend on wherever. We do want, you know, have these kind of restrictions that one would see in Trinidad. So, you know, this latest move, you know, by, well, in this case, Trina, the regulator and the central bank, you know, is going to just put a little more pressure on, you know, the business persons on Trinidad because I spoke to someone recently, they said that they spoke to some persons down there and where they could use to get euros and Canadian dollars to then exchange into United States dollars, that's even harder to get now. So it's a pretty dynamic situation down there. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, on the FCIB rebranding, Christopher says FCIB has rebranded so many times. First, it was CIBC, then First Caribbean CIBC, then FCIB, now reverting back to CIBC. I remember when it used to be Barclays Bank. Like, I'm kind of <laughs> old, so. Nah, you're not old, Kalila. You're just older. <laughs> older millennial. Yeah. Um, yeah, so Ryan also said that first Caribbean was because Barclays had an investment in CIBC Caribbean but pulled out six years ago. So, and one thing to point out in Kalila, uh, first Caribbean is the only Canadian bank that has struggled to actually realize any of their exits in the Caribbean. So, we'd have seen a couple of years ago, actually in 2019, where Scotia Bank would have sold most of their Eastern Caribbean operations. Not Trinidad and Tobago, but other Eastern Caribbean islands to Republic Bank. They'd have sold their Belizean operations to another Belizean entity there. They tried to sell Guyana, that didn't go through. They bought a stake in Domrep. We saw our RBC, RBC, Royal Bank of Canada, which was known as RBTT in Trinidad, and was known as RBTT here in Jamaica as well. They exited the Caribbean. Uh, but, you know, first Caribbean, or I should say, in a CIBC in turn, is not having such ease to actually exit the Caribbean. So to be honest, this rebranding now back to the parent company just kind of makes sense 
I said they've tried to do IPO, tried to sell Madrid interest to a Colombian financial group and tried to even sell some of these different uh, subsidiaries. And it's just been a very difficult process. Mm, okay, let's go to news further overseas. Thank you, Who Am I? Says I look 25 going on 26. That's like almost my daughter's age, but hey, I'll take it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Julian, you have some news from overseas right now concerning REITs. What's going on? Okay, so we just want to talk a little bit about Realty Income Trust. It is a REIT, real estate investment trust, that holds freestanding commercial property in the United States. So just to quote some key metrics and to give an overview of the company, right? So in terms of its six months performance ended June, the net profit after tax was flat, um, while the core rental income was up 20% year over year. And the expense ratio actually moved by about 2.8%. Um, so it moved from 75.73% to 78.5%, but the net profit margin is still comfortably above 20%. So it means that even though operating expenses rose year over year, the margin still remain very healthy. It's a company that generates very strong free cash flow and that feeds into the dividends. Now, this company is unique in that it is one of the few companies on the S&P 500 that pays dividends monthly and not quarterly. So oh. that's very unique for, for investors to consider. In terms of the tradability, it doesn't trade very well. So year to date, the stock is actually down 21.2%. Um, and year over year, it's down 20.3%. And over a five-year period, it's down 18.6%. So there are two ways to look at this. We can look at it as a company that has a strong income opportunity or income generating capacity that is trading cheaply um when we look at the price to book ratio it means that the company is trading at 1.15 um price to book so it's just trading at a 15 percent premium of what it's actually worth from an accounting standpoint per share so we think that the company is cheap with a dividend yield of six percent as we mentioned it pays dividends monthly good cash flow opportunity for investors the type of properties that it holds um, is diverse. It includes grocery stores, convenience stores, pharmacies, warehouses, manufacturing facilities, medical offices, and even farms, vineyards, and orchards. All the over the US? Are Pardon they, me? Are they concentrated in any particular locality? No, they're diversified across the US. Um, and as I mentioned, they have agricultural assets. They have industrial assets. So it's essentially real estate assets that are non-residential. And the top three tenants are Walgreens, 7-Eleven, and Dollar General. So in terms of sector exposure and in terms of locational um, diversification, the company is very attractive, but it's primarily for income purposes. And what's interesting is that the S&P rating, that's S&P Global Credit Rating, is A+. So investors have a chance to participate in a 6% dividend yield that pays monthly on an asset that is investment grade, which is very attractive, um, considering that you're investing in US dollars. So that's Realty Income Trust. Again, the cap gain is not going to be forthcoming like other stocks, for example. Things that are fast movers like a Nike for argument's sake, or even a, um, a Amazon or one of the tech stocks like Facebook. So the idea is to know in, is to know why we invest. This one is primarily an income opportunity. And yeah, it's worth thinking about. Good, good stuff. It's called re what, what called? Realty, Realty income? income Trust. Realty, Realty income, income Trust. trust. Trades yes, it's on been the around for a couple of decades. Trades and on the S&P 500. Realty Income Trust. Awesome. Right. What, David? And just a further context. A REIT is a real estate investment trust that's actually defined by legislation. So in Jamaica, we don't have REIT legislation. And the reason why that matters is in the USA, for example, when a REIT sells a property, and let us say there'd be property, property, or I should say 
capital gains taxes or other taxes to the sale, those taxes, you know, are not attracted or, you know, impacted towards the REIT. The REIT, you know, just reinvest that capital into a new development property and they just keep it in a cycle. And by law, they're required to put 90% of their earnings to shareholders. So, you know, they have protection under the law that, you know, gives them some kind of tax shield to an extent, but the somewhat caveat of that tax shield is you have to, you know, pay a good portion of your earnings out to shareholders, which is a very good thing. So in Jamaica, Kingston Properties Limited, they, you know, kind of build themselves as a REIT, but they don't benefit from a REIT-like legislation like other companies within the USA or other markets that will get in that tax shield when they're selling properties to not be impacted by certain taxes that will be incurred from those sales. Right. Just add, add that context for persons who don't know what a REIT is. Right. So, Julian, a couple comments here for you. Javon says, realty income is not a good stock right now. You did kind of indicate that the stock performance, the price performance hasn't been particularly good over the past five years, but it's more a dividend play. Yeah. So for investors who are looking primarily for dividends, as we mentioned, what's unique about the asset is that the dividend, it pays monthly and it's a company that has a very strong credit rating, A+. plus. So you are getting a 6% dividend yield on an asset that is investment grade. So it's really about um, risk versus reward and knowing what we're looking for. So it's an attractive cash flow return. It's not necessarily an attractive price return. But the other side of the coin is that as investors, we want to buy things that are cheap. And now it is down 21.16% year to date. So if we reinvest, that means that if the stock falls further, our dividend yield will actually increase um, from 6% to a higher return. So there are many different ways to spin it, but we're just talking about cash flow returns. We're not talking about something that is going to rally in the next six months. Um, and again, we want to take a portfolio approach. We want some of our assets to be cash flowing and some of our assets to be generating attractive price returns because we can use the cash flows from one section to finance reinvestment in another section. Um, it's might, it might not be the best thing to have the entire portfolio doing the same thing. It's good to have a mix. Right generally speaking. Right. Who am I says, because he you mentioned the price to book ratio. He says, I don't like price to book ratio as a financial metric because WeWork's price to book was not bad and they went bankrupt today. <laughs> well, we mentioned the credit rating and we also mentioned the diversification of the exposures in terms of the sectors. And we also mentioned that the top three tenants are our blue chip tenants. The number one tenant is Walgreens followed by 7-Eleven, there's Donald General, and there are several other established entities like CVS, which is the second largest pharmacy chain in the US. Um, so in terms of the quality of the cash flows, it would be predicated on the quality of the tenants. And these are our blue, blue chip tenants. And given that the company has an A plus rating from um, S&P Global, it means that the capital base of the company is actually strong. So we're not just talking about PL and profitability. We're talking about capital. And that means that the company's financial health is very strong. Um, in terms of the net profit after tax, it's generating about 420 million US for the half year period. So it's on a run rate to generate 840 million for the full year. And the margin, the net profit margin is above 20%. So in terms of conversion, um, we're seeing a very efficient conversion of net pot compared to the core revenues. And additionally, in terms of cash flow, the cash flow is actually greater than the net pot. So even though in terms of profit, the dividend is larger than the net profit after tax, it's not greater than the operating cash flows. So dividends are predicated on profits, but they're actually paid from cash. And if the cash being generated is higher than the dividend that's being paid out, then the dividend is sustainable. So we're talking about sustainable dividends, regular dividends, dividends that are attractive relative to the rest of the market, 
This company is a part of a group called the Dividend Aristocrats. That is a group that is essentially the highest dividend yielding um, set of stocks on, the, on all of the S&P 500. So these are companies that can be tracked. If you want to look at the financial performance, you can see it. If you want to sell it, somebody is likely to buy it from you. So these are assets that you can get in and out of. You can manage your risk. You can lighten up on it if you want to. You can double down on it if you want to. So there's a lot of flexibility for investors, separate and apart from how much cash is being generated. Awesome. Thanks for explaining, right. Julian. David, we're going to have to wrap it. We do have some questions on other things, but next week we'll look at these. So I saw somebody asking about the Bryden listing. Yes, that will be Friday. So yes, trading would commence on Friday. And check out Learn, Grow, Invest Challenge. They have an interview coming up, I think, this week with, um, not sure who, with who, I think it's with Richard Pandoi about A.S. Bryden. As you know, Separat is majority owner of A.S. Bryden. I also saw a question about, here it is, Javon. Can you shed some light on the recent international bonds the government issued? Um, so next week, again, we actually were trying to get Dr. Nigel Clark on tonight to discuss that but the notice was too short. So look out for more information on that in next week's show. Thanks so much, guys. Thank you, David. Thank you, Julian. We'll see you again soon. Break, and we'll be back with final comments. This segment of Taking Stock, The Analyst, was brought to you by Profit Jump Starter. My need for studies because for those who weren't at the class, trust me, trust me. You see, if you want to be a content creator, you want to be making money from content creation or you want to do marketing or you want to know how to run your business or make money from your business, that class was chef's kiss, chef's kiss. Like in, I think it was like an hour and a half or something like that. And yeah. It was a lot of good information and not only was the information good, but the connections I just, I literally just made probably, no, not probably, definitely over five really valuable connections, about 15 really valuable connections from one free class, free. And let me kind of put it in context because I, I am a networker, like I, I like to network. I like to build connections. Um, I go to a lot of events surrounding networking, right? And on a good night of networking, I will probably leave with maybe four or five really solid connections that I can follow up on after. Five. On a really good night, like when my, my energy is high, I'm super social, um, the the there's a lot of ways for me to really connect with people and you know be relatable on a really good night i will make maybe five connections all right so let's take your final comments or do you want can we play the clip now so that was a testimonial from can't even remember the name the name isn't on it but she attended money marketing last night create and that was you know she just went to social media immediately after to say what it was like for her. And here's a short clip of what we did last night. Last year, I attended an event called FinCon. I attended this year as well. Last year was my first year in person. And there was this young woman at the event and she was in the audience. She wasn't a presenter. She had gained, she had come to her first FinCon the year before. FinCon is a conference for financial content creators. They have it in a different city in the United States every year. Within one year, she had gotten over a million followers on TikTok. So she attended the previous FinCon one. She attended. She hadn't started creating content yet. She attended FinCon, got inspired to start creating content. And by the next FinCon, she had over a million followers. So I asked her, well, how did you do this? How did you get a million followers in a year? And you know what she told me? She said she studied successful people in her niche on TikTok.
and she replicated exactly what they did. So she looked at some of the top financial influencers, which is the niche that she wanted to create content for. And she was like, what are they doing? What are they wearing? What are they talking about? How do they dress? Do they film outside or inside? Are their videos 30 seconds, a minute, minute 30 seconds, two minutes, longer? How often do they post? She just studied them and she replicated what they did. And within a year, she had a million followers. So study your platform. All right, let's look at your final comments. And there are quite a few of them. Um, reminding you as well to go to moneymission.mn.co. Money Marketing is still open. We have three more weeks to go. You can watch the replay now on Money Mission. And next week is the next live course, which is Grow. We're focusing on how to go viral on social media. So final comments. Let me see who we have. Lithium Lily said, is it, if it's one thing I've learned, this awesomeness probably won't last because people will find ways to abuse it. Let me tell you something, Lithium Lily. A couple weeks ago, I was trying to log into my chat GPT account, right? And I apparently accidentally was using a different email address. And so it was prompting me to create a new account. And when I tried to do so, because, you know, you can use email or phone number. I think you have to verify with your phone number or something. It wouldn't allow me because it said that they've detected suspicious activity on ChatGPT using this area code, 876. And I'm like, what are Jamaicans asking ChatGPT? Like, I don't even want to start imagining what Jamaican people have been trying to ask ChatGPT to do why ChatGPT won't even allow, at least temporarily, people with an 876 area code to create new accounts. Like people just always have to abuse things. Who am I says, ChatGPT is awesome. The skill now is making your own questions for AI queries, absolutely. So prompt engineering is one of the hottest new career paths. It's only a year old and they already have a name for it, prompt engineer asking the questions to chat GPT. He also wants to know, do we have black folks creating the response to AI questions? I remember that came up a few months ago when all this technology was still brand new. It's still pretty new. Uh, and he also says, be careful when it comes to software programming, chat GPT could lead you down the wrong path. You will need to modify the chat GPT script. Strong Link says, down, down, down after watching market recap. When will the JSC bottom out? This market is not for weak hearts, pure pressure and pressure bus pipe. But you name Strong Link, so you're good to go. Nano Sen says, watching Cliff Hughes ducking under his desk from far, far away. Strong Link again, news, the Jamaican dollar denominated bonds. Tell us about that if you can. Coming up later this week, Strong Link. Chat GPT can't pick your stock winners, says, who am I? That is true. You can ask it, and it might give you some recommendations, but it's still up to you to use common sense. He says, this market feels like a bear trap, or is it a bull market trap? Very hard to tell the difference. Help us out, Kalila. I'll direct you to Kalila GPT very soon. Ryan, regarding the REIT comment, says, so Jamaicans love copying things and don't have full legislation here in Jamaica to back REIT operations, half glass, half, half glass task. What? Glass half full, is that what you're trying to say? Half glass, something, something. You get the point. We don't have REIT legislation. Well, thank you so much for joining us yet another week. I appreciate your presence. It was great having you here. Tune in later this week. We have some new episodes, all new episodes of The Bottom Line coming out. Next week, we have part two of Money Marketing, which is all about grow, going viral on social media. And then Tuesday, again, we have another episode of Taking Stock. This weekend, I am heading all the way to New Jersey, guys. I shall be in at Princeton University delivering a presentation about the Caribbean economy. So that should be pretty interesting and should be fun. Have I been to, yes, I have been to New Jersey before, but it will be my first time at Princeton, the prestigious Princeton University. So Jersey folks, link up. Maybe we can have a little New Jersey dinner or something. I don't know. Let me know.
Friday to Sunday, I shall be in New Jersey. See you guys next week for Taking Stock and Money Marketing. Until then, later. And of course, let's... Let's get this money. <laughs> <laughs>